Hello there, everyone, and thank you for rejoining me here to you know the Lassies of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mexico Lover, but we got a couple things to talk about, including Southern hospitality. Somehow it's fitting for one of the most powerful men in America to be, pe to be from his biggest state, and for him to live on a cattle ranch passed down from his ancestors who arrived back when it was indisputably part of Mexico. In another world, perhaps it would still be, but Lopez Mateos knew this man would found his way to the top of whatever nation he was in. Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Baines Johnson was certainly aiming to make his guests feel welcome with the bands and dancers and the banners and the color guard and, of course, food. Chicken, pork, corn, biscuits, Lopez Mateo's new visiting the LBJ Ranch would entertain a huge feast. But now, as they walked along a gravel road observing the cows in the distance, they could turn away from festivity and towards more pressing matters. So it's a chumazel again, asked Johnson, scoffing. El Paso wants to settle it. Texas wants to settle it. Heck, I want to settle it back in the 50s, but... Ike wouldn't listen to me. But now things are changing, Lopez Mateo said. Latin America is gr growing ever more important in world affairs, and the Chamazal is becoming quite the sore spot. An example of American imperialism, as some may say. And this whole instance where the U.S. refused to abide by international arbitration. Now I just need your help in getting a compromise passed through the Senate. And you want me to get Nixon aboard? I'm not on good terms with him at the moment, heck. Jack and his not his brother are on board, Mateo uh, assured. I talked to the VP, Kennedy, about this as in an informal conversation, and he's extremely interested in the prospects of improving the image of America abroad and building a stronger relationship. All right, reply, I'll do what I can. Listening to her. That's a big old E. Uh, this little listening tour is all well and good, but you can't go listening to the likes of Enriquez. Have you forgotten what happened in 52? That radical ran against us. Against us? I like what you're doing in Tabasco. Got a real knack for building infrastructure, making good paying jobs for a little guy. Actually getting good stuff done for the Ejidos. Don't suppose you could extend this road, yeah? Here on the map, up the border. Some villages on our side are still living like it's a poor ferratiato, and we don't have all your oil money. Uh, what a speech, Governor Madrazo, what a speech. You truly have a gift. If I may offer a suggestion, though, I think that your points on the development of the cacao industry miss the mark. We should be stressing the provision of cheap corn and grain so that every Mexican have a full belly, not to mention the need for deep reforms to the CNC itself. You understand the youth, and the youth understands you, Madrazo. I don't know how you do it, to be frank. Most prefer listening to that gringo rock and roll racket to a hearing of what we fought for in the revolution. How come they listen to you? You spoke well of the uh, Ejidos, but the real issue is that we're not enforcing Article 123. The future of this country is, is an industrial one, and we must ensure that uh, future, it's the future for a uh, working class. I like your points against foreign do domination, though. Perhaps tariffs aren't the, uh, the answer? The left speaks in many voices, but we all speak well of Madrazo. Is the president of opinion of leftists and nationalists will increase? So, to apparently get to Madrazo, you need to increase the opinion of the leftists and nationalists. I'm not saying we are going to go down that route for this campaign, because I don't I don't really want to, maybe. Um, we've already set ourselves up to basically go down, uh, by this point in episode four, um, uh, to go with maybe him? Maybe Salinas? Well, I, I guess we won't go maybe Ordaz. I mean, that's a pretty generic route, though. I mean, we might play Mexico multiple times. Not one after another, but um, as time goes on. Because that'd be cool to go get all the different routes and whatnot. Which is the region of Mexico. Oh. <clears throat> Some friends of mine. The golden glow of the dawn's light steadily fought against an overwhelming darkness over the Sierra Madre Occidental, casting reflections of heaven's vast wealth over the mountains below. And Dolores, however, the only gold that was generated by solar reflection, and there was almost no wealth to speak of. Under Dolores, however, there was possibly a very different question, yet the excavation of this potential wealth was antithetical to the continued existence of the village whose lands were gifted to it in perpetuity. But there were always ways of dealing with that. An angel and his compatriots approached a barren heap of dirt, the third such town in his week. In a sense, he considered himself a traveling salesman for ore, lumber, cattle, whatever else his clients required. Angel could, with time, acquire them with some prime real estate. Free people, free problems. Unresolved mystery among thousands and by the rurals, books, perhaps, but not one anyone would care to look at too thoroughly. In places where people already live so close to the edge, little effort would be required to send them packing to somewhere more useful, never to return. As such, he and his men were rather surprised to find a large crowd standing in front of the village entrance. Those in the rear held banners, stating General Union of Mexican Workers and Peasants, as well as a handful of trite slogans. Those in the front, however, screaming curses that Angel's men held hatchets, hammers, and other improvised weapons. He had a shotgun, but only a couple of shells. More for intimidation than a serious fight. He raised it anyways, but they did not back down. After a while, he gave a look to his men, they backed away slowly. They had places to be and money to make elsewhere, but they'd be back. We have a cup of drink grape uh, water here, and we have some decaf coffee, because I like to get to sleep tonight, maybe. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, a lot of comments with me, Madrazo. If I don't get in this round, we'll get definitely another round. We should help the entire economy here, as some of you have said. Um, of course, we're going to work on all these places for building stuff, but uh, we're getting there. Definitely getting there. Also, the more I learn from this campaign, the better I can do the next campaign, too. So, 
So we'll see. The conspiracy. The Ready Mix Factory office was not built to hold five men, let alone five planning to assassinate the Generalissimo of the Dominican Republic. The tech quarters were exacerbated by the crate protruding over the top of Tony Ember's desk, stuffed to the brim with dynamite and military supplies from World War II that he had stockpiled for the June 14th movement. The three M14 rifles that the FBI had provided lay to the crate's side, but was almost jabbing into Amadito's stomach. A briefcase of $12,000, give or take a Benjamin, sat in the Ember's desk chair awaiting a plan. A Salvador whistle. He had enough dynamite here to blow up the goat on the whole stage. He's got ready to mocha. Uh, a moment of silence before De La Maza answered. That's not enough. Blackie Trujillo on Rumfies. Johnny Abs and every darn Calais in the Republic would go into frenzy. They'd burn Mocha, my home, to sinners. Imagine what they'd do to June 14th, but for months, in every city, to every family. No. John Diaz looked up from the rifle. He was. Inspecting to meet Antonio's eyes, we need to give Popo Roman and the th military time to take control instead. They'd be assassinated Trujillo in a remote location. Amadito chimed in in the evening. He always says to send Cristobal for sex. Probably has dragged half the capital's women there by now. There's barely anyone on the road then. The lieutenant turned to the silent Embert. We need one heck of a car to chase him down. Tony Embert nodded slowly. Well, the economy's looking pretty good for now. Now we're doing industry without smokestacks. Um, so we read this one last time. We're going to this one. Please go ahead. So we'll have the titans of American transportation. Uh, Lopez... Uh, Mateos and Secretary Ordaz looked at over the next portion of the itinerary, and the hotel lobby over a cup of coffee. The smell of eggs and bacon permeated from the direction of the kitchen as the two had decided to order the American stable for the day's first meal. Lopez Mateos fingers over a portion of the document. Forged ties with Americans' heavy industry, the confused president read aloud, then looked over Ordaz. This could mean a lot of things, Ordaz. What kind of heavy industry were you thinking about? Also, if you're wondering about Canadian investment, please go ahead, too. I heard that last time. Yeah. Um... Glad you asked, sir. Ordaz pulls out a map of the U.S., mildly oversized the situation at hand. Our two main business opportunities lie here. He circles Seattle with a pen, and here. Ordaz has to get up from a chair to a little to reach Detroit, which he circles. Lopez Mateos was following. Let me guess. Boeing and General Motors? Indeed, sir. The choice is difficult, the president says, with Ordaz nodding. The automotive industry in Detroit will be much easier to cooperate with, considering the growing car industry. Lopez Mateos looked back at Seattle. It was imperative that we make headway in the airline industry at some point. The future won't come by itself, he thought. After a few minutes of weighing the options, the choice became obvious. Go to Seattle. Um, they would slap. We cut tariffs, didn't we, on automobiles earlier? Huh. I mean, it's the 60s, so we're doing okay on cars. But is that going to last forever? Eventually, I think it was in our timeline where the airline industry was much more deregulated eventually in the 60s. Was it the 60s? So you can make the common man actually fly? It sounds like more money. Let's go to Seattle. And when does this kick off? Oh, three days. Nice. The magical flight. The Boeing capital, or the Boeing plant in Renton, Washington, 10 miles south of Seattle, was a scale of a scale that President Lopez Mateos had never before witnessed. Lines of Boeing 727's frames lined the million square foot plant, though the Mexican president's press tour was located towards the end, home to one of the first completed airframes. Sleeker and smaller than the 707, the new airliner stood out through its top turbine engine, accompanied by two more just below on the sides of the air fuselage. Beautiful, isn't she? The Boeing executive asked Lopez Mateos. You got that right, behind the curated a press speech. The president was in a genuine sense of awe, accompanied by a hint of jealousy. One day, Mexico might just be home over to her own gorgeous machines, designed and made into a plant just like this one. And to the president, he thought to himself. After the tour, Ordaz and uh, the president were making their way to the office to talk business, though a decision had to be made first. Your Excellency, Ordaz began his usual spiel on the options of him. We can go the safe route, using a rather less skilled industrial base to take part in the supply chain. Basic components, raw resources, that kind of thing. Or we could offer ourselves a great target of investment. Lopez Mateos perked up a plan in Mexico, a subsidiary, if you may. That'd be quite something, Ordaz. Both options had the merits. Uh, though Mateos knew Ordaz had a preferred opinion, Ordaz, he seemed to have thought that this would propose. Play our strengths. Offer access to our resources. A plan is something we cannot pass up. Offshoring fails takeoff. Well, if I don't want fails, a secondary role. Let's play to our strengths. I don't want to do anything that fails. Maybe that was good to do, but... Now boarding Aeromexico Flight 14, economy class, Javier dragged his bag onto the tarmac, not before taking note of this flight's exterior. The humming of the three, Pratt and Whitney JT-8Ds in the rear of the craft was a dead giveaway. This is a brand new Boeing 727 straight off the line, straight assembly line of the Boeing Renton factory in Washington State. The classic Aeromexico livery, a red horizontal stripe down the fuselage was shining with polish with the classic Eagle Knight logo at the tail fin finishing the pattern. It was an impressive, gorgeous feat of engineering, Javier noted, but it could have been so, so much more. Javier slowly made his way up to the stairs and into the aisle of the cabin, running his hands across each of the seats in the first-class cabin, feeling the uncorroded aluminum frames of the floor-bound furniture. This was his doing, his making, born out of countless hours of manual labor in the months prior at his workplace in Ectapec. When hearing of the potential deal between Lopez Mateos and Boeing, the workplace lit up with joy. 
The expertise were to place them first in line to be absorbed into a hypothetical boiling Mexico plant, an integral place of a New Mexican supply chain that would produce planes for Mexico, in Mexico, along with Boeing pay grade. In the end, it seems the president was content with selling his cheap labor instead in exchange for a few planes. <clears throat> Such childish hopes, Javier thought. Why well, go through the cost of making a new plant when you can remain a subservient part supplier to Uncle Sam, content with mediocrity and stagnation? Such innovation should have to wait a little more, I guess. Sitting down, Javier mumbled to himself, Mexican miracle, my butt. Yeah, maybe I should have done this one. I guess maybe we're going to go with our dots. That's probably the generic answer for that one. But now we're at five, which is a little concerning, but if it's at five, it's negative. Um, so we go to the ugly American. Ooh. So we'll see what happens. And hopefully the coup kicks, kicks off. Well deserved optimism. Your Excellency, our efforts in economic development are currently exceeding initial expectations. Investor sentiment, both domestic and foreign, has increased notably as of late, thanks in large part to the productive potential of our growing industrial sector. At the same time, living standards of the general population has also risen to unforeseen heights. This can be attributed to the development of key infrastructure and services, as well as steady increases in average wages. Should these trends continue, that would be most advantageous to further our goals. See, please, the, the summary below. Oh, great. GDP went up a little. Oh, actually. Ooh. From 18, oh, yeah, went from here. I guess this is where we start, ended. So we started. Growth, 8.3% versus 6. GDP per capita, uh, well, agronomic productivity, uh, barely higher. Oh, we failed in unemployment. Oh, whoopsie. That's not good. Poverty got better. We, more civilian were put apart. Industrial loyalty will increase, as well as worker loyalty. Antonio Ortiz Mena, Secretary in Hacienda and Public Credit. Because of our stellar performance, Mexico is becoming more stable and our political influence strengthened. Awesome. That's great. That is fantastic. And, and we got better deficit already. It's not great. This is not getting too much worse. And GDP growth has gone up even more. Awesome. Uh -huh. So, population briefing. Quality of life briefing. Economic growth. Do we have any projects? No. Uh, where can we see? I don't remember. Where can we see... Uh, Our goals. Agriculture. Population. Urban migration. Oh man, where is it? Isn't it supposed to kick off? I guess we can do that one too if we really need to. Uh well, the Chamazal. The time's coming to put an end to the Chamazal border dispute. Presidents Lopez Mateos and Nixon will meet in a landmark ceremony to ratify the treaty recommendations made in 1911. 366 acres of the Chamazal will be granted to Mexico, along with 71 acres of the adjacent Cordoba Island area. The United States will receive 193 acres, while officially no money will exchange hands. Uh, Mateos has arranged for a large sum to be wired to the states through an independent bank as compensation for U.S. infrastructure that will end up on Mexican soil as a result of the deal. A memorial will be erected to commemorate this historic occasion where two neighbors working together towards a peaceful resolution to a conflict. A great day for Mexico and a great day for the U.S. Disembodied voice. The words flowed from Carlos Madurado's mouth in torrents, then trickles. Sage whispers and explosive shouts caught ears from Omar Elos to the Yucatan. The first inkling of a reformist press would take each well-crafted phrase and stamp it onto the paper, capturing the unending dictation of the southern cyclone. But the man himself knew it was not enough. Madrazo had established himself as a successful governor, a regional leader, and a man of the left, but the latter was still too fragmented and fractious to influence Lopez Mateos' decision on who was to succeed him. And so Madrazo would roar on as the revolution had. He would shore up support, create a durable force for action over the next sexenio. The coming presidency for the sake of Mexico needed a unified reformist bloc in the PRI and a focused cadre on the streets, and he would build that base himself, one speech at a time. He has unified the left, but true influence has managed to evade him. Oh, my bad for those who wanted him. I'm open to anybody and everybody here for now. Slightly comfortable, huh? Moderately comfortable. Slightly desperate. Slightly comfortable. Slightly desperate. In the southwest, eh? It's mostly rural. You know, yeah, it's only five. Um, 
Where's the loyalty? Ottawa or Vancouver? We'll read in just a moment. So worker loyalty is 89. It's not bad. Peasantry's looking pretty good too. Not bad. Doug Jones is very loyal. Even the Industrials are pretty loyal too. So it doesn't really matter each either one. I want to lower the state industry minus five percent. That's so strong. How am I doing this? Lower unemployment. That'd be pretty good, probably. Yeah. Oh wait, that's base stimulation. Hurts urban quality of life. Uh, you know, we can do this one. More base stimulation? Why not? Uh, president Lopez Mateo sat alone. Uh, it enjoying a rare instance of solitude. Being president meant that he spent all day, every day, surrounded by advisors, lobbyists, and other individuals who sought to both give counsel and influence his decision making. This moment was a fleeting opportunity to ignore the duties of his office for a small length of time and just relax. Yet as he allowed his mind to wander, his attention was brought back to a looming decision he had to make for the Canadian leg of his North American trip. Lopez Mateo and his entourage were expected to visit Ottawa, the seat of the Canadian government, to meet with the Canadian counterparts. Yet, if he decided uh, to take a brief tour of Vancouver, a myriad of options would present themselves. The city is Canada's gateway to the Pacific Ocean, and it's chafing under open rule that restricts trade with the sphere. Businesses there would jump at the chance to use Mexico as an intermediary to reach the Japanese market. However, there are other factors to consider. Offering Canadians a backdoor to the sphere wouldn't be popular with the Americans, and the whole point of the story was to win them over. Was detouring from his primary objective for a chance at a few extra Canadian dollars really worth it? Maintain course. We're going to go with the pitch. President Lopez Mateos was using his flight to Ottawa as an opportunity to consider what he was doing or going to discuss with the Canadian business leaders he'd be meeting with. Ordaz and his staff spent a significant amount of time briefing the president on what Mexico could offer these business magnates. In the end, two possible avenues were discussed, oils and ships. The first uh, would be to open up Mexico's oil supply to Canadian businesses. The goal was to entice them with lower energy costs through a new relatively close supplier in Mexico. Uh, in return, the president was hoping that Mexico would use these investments to continue building up Mexico's oil industry, a win-win situation where both sides benefit. The other option was to attempt and create a partnership between Mexico and Canada based on shipbuilding. The logic behind this was that Canada needed to increase their supply of sh commercial ships, and Mexico has a little labor to assist in the endeavor. This proposal also has the convenient side effect of lessening Canada's dependence on the American merchant marine. In the end, Lopez Mateos had to decide on which proposal to build his overall picture on. So how to say no to black gold. Commerce needs ships to thrive. Money makes the world go round. Upon deaf ears? That doesn't sound like it's good for us. I would like to build up oil more, but if it's upon deaf ears, we'll go with that one then. The meeting between the Anglo-Canadian executives and Lopez Mateos was chock full of disclaimers. It carried the tone of two children speaking poorly of their elder, unsure if they were listening in. While Canada has appreciated the might of its American shipbuilding partners, and is fully committed to fighting the imperialism of Japan and its, em um, and its empire, our industry would greatly appreciate a the official grudge struggle to find a non-confrontational board, mild decoupling from some of the restraints that the Americans pose in our trading opportunities while using their shipping. Lopez Mateos knew that what the man was trying to say and decided to let the tension in the air through more direct rhetoric. We would also like to trade with the co-prosperity sphere, the president paused for a moment as everyone became a little bit more relaxed. While the Japanese have done much wrong, it does not give the Washington the right to completely dictate our trade practices. With this deal, we can have a new merchant marine, controlled only by Ottawa and Mexico City. The businessman now is timid responded, a trade triangle, if you may. While Canada cannot directly trade with Japan, your Pacific ports can serve as fine facilitators. The man offered his hand to Lopez Mateos, which he sh shook firmly. Of course. They're fiercely loyal. There goes Israel annexing things. Can I say that? Nah, I don't care. Oh, look at this. Tujio, where are you going? What is happening? 0.55, not bad. Did that help out at all? Not really. Boop. Coordination. Armament organization regain. Sure. Haiti. Can't wait till everything falls apart. <laughs> I do want to keep... Try to keep at least 50 political power on at all times. Worker loyalty will increase. Oh, where's worker loyalty? Hey, happy February, everybody. Yeah, 84. So we want to increase uh, urban quality of life. Quality of life. Slightly comfortable, moderately comfortable, slightly comfortable. So places that have very uh, urban, we want to do that one for. So, so population. Uh, it's not bad. That's actually pretty good. 
Is there any? I didn't realize at the time. I just read stimulation. Is it base stimulation? I want more. Really. So we can't do anything there. Public housing. Public housing. Quality of worker. So. Stimulation. Of course, Mexico City is going to be very urban. We want the most bang for our buck. That's not bad. Central North. West. Slightly urban, slightly urban. Moderately rural. Obviously, here would be best. Quality of life here. It's pretty good. But that increases the amount of uh, urban migration we're going to have. Because right now it's pretty rural here. And because of this, point a little bit uh, migrates from the region into the cities. Hmm. You can increase the quality of life here for urban people, but that's going to hurt us. Accelerates urban migration. Can you have the reverse? For 20. I increased both. That's not bad. It's only for 10. Doesn't do much. But we can't get more worker quality here. A little loyalty. You know what? It's only 10. That's increased by very much. Does this uh, does quality of life decrease? That is my question. It doesn't look like. Uh, simulation will not be as good, but whatever. Hey, 0.51 is better. Growth, 8.2%. Hey, dead to GDP ratio actually went down. A meeting of two eagles. The car pulled up before the large white building that was a residence of the most powerful man in the OFM, Lopez Mateos. Took a deep breath and stepped out before the crowd of cameras and reporters all hoping to get a shot of him. They certainly got it. Mateos' aides having to push some of them aside so he could actually reach President Nixon. Nixon scowled the reporters as one might look upon flies swarming around in the summer heat. His expression shifted only slightly when Mateos reached him. <clears throat> Nixon put his hand to shake out Mateos, a gesture Mateos accepted dispassionately. As the two men did their best to smile and make small talk, Mateos concealed his bubbling anger. He met with Nixon several times before, and though he was hardly a pleasant man, Mateos once believed him to be trustworthy. The Aleutian crisis had disabused him of that notion. Nixon was obviously lying about U.S. activity in the Northern Pacific, and to cover his tracks, he had undermined Mateos' mediation, duped Ordaz, and threatened to start a nuclear war. <coughs> Please come inside, Nixon said at last, although his tone was far from warm. Business like was the way that Mateos would describe it. Nixon let go of his hand and led him into the White House. Richard, let me get straight to the chase. Uh, Mateos said as he followed behind, our first order of business ought to be the Chamazal border dispute. This issue has become a perpetual thorn on both of our sides. On that, we are agreed, Nixon replies, as we reach the Oval Office. I have some thought on that. What do you have in mind, Richard? Or Tricky Dick, rolling up her sleeves. Oh, look at this. Ooh, more inflation, though. Ugh. All of our efforts today are directed towards the development of our nation's future, and in the face of the ever more pressing needs to secure a place in this world. It's time to recognize that our foundation for future development lies completely within the confines of our ability to raise crucial funding, whether they be for new projects or new programs. To ensure participation from all able sections of society, we are prepared to draft some emergency legislation with the express purpose of harnessing the desperately desired financial resources our government finds itself starved of. Ultimately, this entails the most affluent businesses in Mexico to donate a portion of their wealth, putting the necessary capital in their hands. Given our generosity in these past few years, they should have no choice but to oblige. Hey, los Guerrerenes. Guerrerenes. Uh, Chilpancingo trembled once again, but at this time, it was not the sound of gunfire that shattered the silence. It was a scandal of similarly ominous proportions. After months of deceptive tranquility, the city was violently jolted to its core. The air crackled to life, with tension as pieces of paper like a blizzard of white adorned the doors of the revered Cathedral of the Assumption. This hallowed sanctuary, once the seat of Anahuac's Congress, was now bore witness to a befitting manifesto. The message etched upon those sheets of paper reverberated with an urgency that stirred the very soul of the Chilpancingo. It was a rallying cry, a desperate plea for the people of Guerrero, nay, for the entire na nation or state, to awaken from their slumber of oppression and terror. The ominous shadow cast by the relentless armed forces, who had called callously trampled upon the innocent and quashed the spirit of the citizens, could not longer be ignored. In equality, a venomous scourge that had left them destitute must be confronted head on. Uh, the manifesto blazed with righteous indignation. Igniting a fiery passion within the hearts of all who read it to serve as a stark reminder of their proud and rich history, a history intertwined with the legendary deeds of El Odoro, Castillo, and Los Galianta, Galeana, a history that spanned a century and began with the visionary Patricio Juan Alvarez. 
It called upon the people to draw strength and inspiration from their glorious past and rekindle the flickering flame of revolution. They now teeter perilously in the hands of those who once championed the cause, the very party that proudly carried the mantle of the revolution. The words of the scandalous revelation spread like wildfire, drawing scores of people to the sacred uh, heaven of the cathedral. Some scandalized, others discreetly curious. The message was clear, its resonance undeniable, and for the first time the call to action echoed throughout the hearts of the people. Reverberated with a newfound determination that would shape the future of the state, the revolution reaches its first hearts. Yeah, I think focusing on the economy, especially these, oh, these things, is pretty good. It hurts our productivity, which sucks, but real quality of life does go up. And you get more loyalty, a little more debt, but you get more political power too, which we have to have. Some farms are slightly unproductive. Um, we're just lowering the productivity just a little bit. I don't want to lower productivity from everybody. And rural quality of life. Honestly, we can do it in the Southwest, maybe. It'll go up. It's slightly worse than these guys, so. So look at this. So it does kind of work. We estimate that rural quality of life is better. Slows down urban migration. So does that mean we're actually taking people away? The real ground flow is undeterred. The 1911 arbitration results are the surest path of solving the dispute, I've come to believe, Nixon answered, as the two sat across from one another, surrounded by the trappings of the Oval Office. That ought to settle the matter and keep both the peoples happy. But Taylor's grin despite himself. Yeah, it's settled over well with both parties and the people. It won't make much convincing at all to get them on board. It was as if a weight had been lifted from Mateo's shoulders, even if the real battle was yet to come. The rest of the conversation flowed from there, with the two discussing topics ranging from cross-border trade to continue efforts to coordinate opposition to the Nazis. The meeting was going quite well, and smoothly, as the two similarly found a core on numerous topics. At some point in the conversation, refreshments were brought in. Nixon seemed much more relaxed than he had been out with the press, something Mateos was grateful for. With spirits flying high and the two finding common ground on several issues, Mateos Lopez pushed towards his ultimate goal with renewed confidence. And as to, to the last item on our agenda, he began, I was curious how the United States might feel about supporting a bid for Mexico to host the Olympic Games. I know that Detroit has a competing bid, but given how much we've found agreement on already, I think that this presents a golden opportunity to show the world the wealth and unity of not just Mexico, but the whole of the Americas. So I was thinking, you could drop the bid for Detroit and support Mexico City as a symbol of our renewed friendship. Mateo said his breath. Oh boy, well, I mean, how much do we have? We have, we have four, it's not bad. Unexpected overtures. Yeah. So, wrong position. Come on. A sweet taste of legacy. I've already spoken with the U.S. Olympic Committee, and they've agreed to a compromise. Nixon explained as he began pouring some champagne for toast. The plan we've agreed to is this. The OFM will support Mexico City as part of the next side of the Olympic Games. In exchange, Mexico will support America's bid to host the Games next time we're in the running. Mateos was lightheaded as he finally released his breath he'd been holding in. His mind fizzled almost as much as the champagne that was being handed to him. Gladly taking it, he replied, Well, uh, what a well thought out compromise, Richard. We'll have to discuss this proposal back in Mexico City, but I am certain there's no, be no resistance. I will ensure my successor knows that this agreement is essential. Good, Nixon slid forward as they held their glasses together. Unity against the fascists. To her renewed friendship, Mateos clinked the glasses together and took a sip of the champagne, letting the liquid slide across his taste buds. The tingling sensation it left beyond was just a feeling of needed, he needed, after a victory like this. It was as if he could already hear the cheering crowds filling the stadiums across the nation. He could see the press from all over the globe coming to see the wealth and prosperity of the Mexican miracle. And he could feel the jubilation of the masses, inspired to see Mexico triumphantly rising to a position of prominence on the world stage. And to a lasting legacy, Mateo said through a wide grin, let the preparations commence. All factions of PRI, PRI give us that support. Uh, are we a stressed out person? I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I feel a lot of stress too, but... I'm going to close that one out for now. New public housing, urban quality of life. Well, let's see anything over here. Sponsor industry. Unemployment. Really destroy unemployment. Hmm. So we have this. It's because there's nothing we can do over there. Mm -hmm. Plus 6% stimulation, that's not bad. What are you, what's your base? 45.75? Oh, no. 45.24. Slightly active, moderately active. Yeah, you're moderately active, slightly active, slightly inactive. Moderately active, that's good. So if we do, uh, I want, I want the 21. Uh, unemployed population. Uh, 
It's not bad. So does that do anything else? Just unemployment and stimulation. That's it. What's your base? 36.24, you're already there. Unemployed population is... There are actually a lot of people already unemployed. So we want to... Where, do, where can we see... Unemployment rate? Because I want to hit, hit it the hardest. That's not too bad to do in the Gulf. How about this area here in general? 42 is already pretty good. 50... 51... Um, was this northeast? Is not bad. Now the west is not bad. 51.7... And how about over here? Uh, 51.6. It doesn't really matter too much. And what do we say it was here? 47%. That's a lot less people that are unemployed. Uh, we're going to do it in the center here, maybe. Just because we get the most bang for a buck, because we got a lot of population here, I think. Yeah. What else we got? Tourist campaign. Rural quality of life goes up. Public housing. For now, is there anything else we can do here? I mean, operation begins. Oh, in 46 days, okay. Uh, supply, we could probably get a little more supply. 15 political power, operational strength. Ooh. Going to two. This. That's fine. It's fine, it's fine as well. Fine. 100, minimum 38. Malagasy. Good cooperation with America. Nice. Unemployment or poverty? It's looking better. Happy March, everybody. So everything falls apart, of course. Hey, less than 60%. Nice. Good stuff. Uh, working standards, urban quality of life. Extremely rural there. Quality of life. Urban quality is just a little better. Urban migration. Extremely productive, extremely productive, slightly unproductive. Uh, yeah. Maybe you want that, though. Southeast, we can do uh, stimulation. 10%, wow. Okay, we'll go with that one. Wow. Moderately active, that's good. Snap breeze kills hundreds. UK is not having a good time. Granado. The Chevy by uh, Biscayne slice across the parking lot of De La Maza sawmill, swerving around staggered cones. From its right hand side, rang out shot after shot from the M14. Even the sharp turn, sudden braking, and the rush of the Biscayne's V8 engine, Amadito and Antonio still found their mark more often than not. Salvador looked up from his stopwatch to see Amadito plug one of the silhouettes right where Trujillo's mustache would be and gave a loud whistle. 52 seconds, much better. He called to Tony and Bert, already starting on another lap. Behind the wheel. Tony grinned as he rounded a corner in a cloud of dust. Automatic transmission, AC, hydraulic brakes. He had installed the souped-up headlights himself. Best of all, it could reach over 100 miles an hour, but more than enough to, more than enough to chase down the blue Toyo Pet crown that the goat rode him. As though Tarko yelled out that they'd reached the 50 seconds on the next lap, Tony pulled over next to his own far more humble truck. As Amado and De La Maza, uh, De La Maza reloaded, he hoisted a large metal crate out of the bed. Perhaps not as flashy as uh, Biscayne, but he brought another gift courtesy of the metalworking friend. Salvador tried to over the unveiled his prize, sure, in 12 gauge brownings and enough ammo for a thousand generalissimos. Before Amadito or Antonio could exit the car, El Turco managed to thank God and his friend Tony. By the time they reached the shotguns, he ripped that target in half with an explosive shell. To hunt a goat, one must be well equipped. Great. Fantastic. Look at that GDP growth rate. And the fuel trip. Mr. Gamis, how big is it, Actaker? Asked a student, pointing to one of the banners ahead of them, where Arturo's brother Jacobo and his students were standing. It read, three hectares per head of cattle. How much for us? Well, you know, a soccer pitch outside the school said, uh, Arturo, a hectare, hectare, uh, is a little better than that. Three of them, all just for one cow, and in the big cattle farms, there are thousands of cows. But why? I can't see my brother anymore, because the government said there were no land for him. So I had to move to Juarez. He didn't need three hectares. Why are cows more important than him? They're not. Don't ever say that. Nothing's more important than the welfare of ordinary people. It's just that we don't make the government's friends as much money, so they all want us working in factories or in the big company farms. The voice of another student came in. But Mr. Gamis, why are we here? They want to build a mine over Dolores, not a cow farm. Wasn't this meant to be a field trip about the revolution? Why are we walking three days to help out your brother? 
Pedro snapped the Turo. This is all about the revolution. This is where the country lay before the revolution, before the land reform. During the Porfiriato, the backs of the Mexican people were broken, their land stolen, all to please the industrialists and the Americans. And only through the peasants and workers banded together to oppose them did we gain any sort of respite. So we're not just here to help my brother, we're here to help create solidarity, and that is your lesson. That is what is necessary to end the tyranny of yesterday, and what is necessary to stop it today. If the peasants of the Chihuahua can't band together, they'll wipe us all out one at a time, and who will be there to remember us? Ooh, look at this, money. Pay debt. Better, better, not bad. Safe harbor. The due west of Mexico City was one of the great infrastructure projects of the Mateos legacy. Uh, located on the Pacific coast, the city of Melcuar Ocampo was being transformed into a port town. Once completed, the new port was expected to be one of the largest shipping cities in the Pacific Basin. Not only was it the flagship project of Mateos' new infrastructure for Mexico, but it was a key step on the nation's journey onto the world stage. Melcuar Ocampo Port will be Mexico's gateway to the Pacific, a place where so much of the lucrative trade with the sphere could be exploited. President Mateo slumped into a simple wooden chair in an empty apartment in the em an employee lodging building. It had been temporarily transformed into a makeshift presidential suite for his visit. It felt good to be alone. There was nobody to watch him slouch, nobody to smile for. Mateo soaked in the sun, piece piercing, piecing together the long day he just had. When you're a president, every day is a long day, but this one especially so. Mateo liked to keep a close eye on his big projects around the Milk or Ocampo port, which was the biggest one of them all. This particular day, he traveled to the construction site to see it in person. His staffers had organized a full schedule of handshakes and warm greetings. Mateos toured the port, meeting the construction workers, union leaders, private contractors, and local officials. He enjoyed the step of work. It was easy, yet he knew that it meant a lot to the workers that had shown up. Mateos had spent so many years as a politician that he even forgot what it was like to be a starstruck. To see powerful men as something more than they actually were. Most of the men Mateos met have never met a president before and never will again. Now, all Mateos has is an empty room for a phone. Uh, a phone that connects his tiny, once abandoned slats in Mexico directly to the National Palace. After only a few moments of brief reprieve, the phone rang for him. Mateo said it ring. Tomorrow he would pass judgment on a larger number of things. Tomorrow he decides today is for himself. Nothing was built in a day. Problem resolved. Now they've forgotten the long laundry list. Ooh, look at this. We've done a lot. There's nothing so gratifying as to look back upon accomplishments. Like a king looking down from his castle on the hill upon his thriving capital. The fruits of our labor have blossomed, and the Mexican miracle continues to leap and bound with no signs of slowing. Alas, every bustling metropolis there lies the heaps of waste that lie in the outskirts. Behind the Mexican miracle, there are a large number of unfinished or otherwise lacking infrastructure projects in desperate need of attention. Thankfully, the economic boom has generated a great excess of wealth that we have in our reserves, and it's always certainly better to invest our money. We can begin crossing off items on our list by outlining some new economic de and developmental plans and setting up some basic infrastructure in the relevant areas. After all, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and the West gets more stimulation, great loyalty, power, infrastructure, and a naval base. The Metro Question Regent of the Federal District, Ernesto P. Orochortu, faced a crowd of cameras and microphones. He was outside a newly built tram station, with tram drivers standing to both sides of him. Remember to smile at launch into his prepared remarks. Thanks to the hard work of our engineers and laborers, the new tram line is opening ahead of schedule. This expansion will help reduce traffic by providing many residents with an alternative means of transportation. The Iron Region was content to leave it at that, but a reporter quickly raises him. Licenciado Orchurtu, you've been building all kinds of new infrastructure. Are you planning to cap it off with the metro? According to the study, fast lanes from Mexico City, a metro would reduce traffic significantly. The tram driver stiffened up. Orchurtu scowled. He'd been getting this question for years, and his answer had not changed. No, I'm not. I strongly disagree with the findings of that study. The most effective way to reduce traffic is to build more expressways and to expand existing infrastructure. A metro would be extremely expensive. It will only worsen the problem of urban sprawl. That was mainly a problem. Uh, because it couldn't tax anything beyond the federal district's borders, but he left that unsaid. Let me be clear, Urtu Chortu said, becoming more animated, I will not waste public tax pesos on a metro. Not one cent will go towards such a project. Not one cent. So long as the Iron Region stands, the metro cannot move. Interesting remarks. And now we have a problem resolved and another forgotten. The silence engulfing Ordaz inside his office made him anxious. To him. Waiting was more exhausting than working. The president was supposed to be wrapping up his trip to America, and Ordaz awaited the result after work hours, hopefully in the form of a call from the man himself. He thought of possible issues for him to tackle in the meantime, although he continued to find himself glued to the chair regardless. His only issue, he thought, the issue of recovering his tattered reputation in the wake of the Lucian's debacle. Tick tock, tick tock. Wrapped inside the percussion of the wall mounted clock, Ordaz was jolted back into the room as a phone rang, his hand instantly reaching for it. A second through Ordaz, as cold demeanor marked the end of his, to his rare moment of introspection. Ah, oh, does. So happy to hear of you after such a long uh, day of these port negotiations. One can only have so much business speak in such a short time. 
Lord Dallas gave a light chuckle. Well, likewise. Likewise. My day has been packed as well, so a nice checkup was welcome. A bold face lot. I just want to say Lord Dallas, a trip to North America. Lord Dallas's verdict is here. It was great. Very few complaints on my end and quite productive overall. You would make for a bad travel agent. The two lads talked about the trip, although Lord Dallas gathered all he needed from the conversation. The trip was a resounding success, all thanks to him. For the first time since the Lucian's crisis, the secretary could rest knowing his and Lopez Mateos' good graces once more. It had to be for the sake of his career. So hopefully we start going soon. I mean, there was a few comments from yesterday, but... No, oh, three weeks. A little more than three weeks. Um, that's not bad. To uh, infiltrate agents. Can we lower criminality anymore? Tensions will decrease. It's not bad. Dominican Republic gets a little worse. Uh, what are we doing? That? Coordinate with, this, with these guys? Sure. Criminality is 21. You get less money, which sucks, but... The final hurdle. The months, past months have been a decathlon for President Lopez Mateos. And the last two events have been particularly challenging. He and what felt like every diplomat and economist that PR I could muster just wrapped up two hours long meetings, separate of course with the US and Japanese ambassadors and carefully selected members of each nation's business community. The stated goal was to finance construction of a port in Melcor Ocampo, a vast enterprise that required equally vast sums of dollars, yen and pesos to pay for it all, but the potential rewards would be great indeed, so great the president could recite the export and import figures. I'd hope to have them drilled into his head twice. Drilled into his head, yes. That's what his headache felt like. But nothing, nothing ever came free. Lopez Mateos had promised preferential trade rights to the Yankees, offered favorable jurisdiction to Osakans. The port project was an immense sausage. It was benefits were being carved up and offered to as many foreigners as Mexicans, but its riches, juices, grease, and lubricated the path to an even greater prize. The Olympic host city voting was approaching. After so many concessions, after so many headaches, what was one more? The finish line was in sight, even if he had to drag himself across it. Our proposal value will be tested in the balancing act. The ruffling newspapers filled uh, the Madrazo's oh, crap, uh, office as he shuffled through the issues. Page after page, article after article, and not a people bought the port as Millicourt or Campo would be selling away his port country to the Japanese and Americans in a few years' time. Not even his contacts in Mexico City had any reports on protests or complaints against the project. Sign, the governor reached for the table as he put those papers down instead of grabbing his cup of coffee and turning around the face of the window. Those sales must have gone to him, or Daz and Salinas, he thought, gave away all the country's resources just for an ounce of popularity with the big man. As he ground himself in reality, however, Madrazo thought of Lopez Mateos and his ability to smooth talk his way through politics and business like a no other, striking up all those deals without an ounce of opposition, all while balanced between countries, or a statesman right there. Either way, Madrazo talks himself, I hope he knows what he's doing, a tight rope between giants, which can quickly seize any political opportunities we have gained through the negotiations. Seize any political opportunity. And you see the crisis. Oh boy. Out with the crash. Uh, let's see. Mexican miracle. Yeah, this hasn't really changed. Slightly more influence for us, but not, not much. Um, and we have no other projects here yet. So, yeah. El Tapado enjoys stability. I guess it's high. I guess we'll probably go with them low. Negative five. Oof. Unexpected overture. Look at that. Plaza was four, which you guys reminded me of. State of the war and fascism. Nice. Ooh, why not two? Ooh. An Olympic outcome. Nice. Let's only back America's 1972 bid. Celebrations are in order. Just uh, uh, nationalists. Memo from Secretary Salinas. For the President of the United Mexican States, upon opening of Tokyo Exchange, the bankruptcy of Yasuda Corporation caused double digit. Lopez Mateos ran his fingers across each line of the Secretary Salinas' report. On each page, it trembled just a little more. Widespread ripple effect in Hong Kong, Manila, Calcutta. He skipped a few paragraphs. Japanese investments in Mexico affected as well. Crap. He continued. As Prince had much left in store for him, unfortunately, reading a report after affected companies and stock prices, the president skipped all the drug and impatiently went straight to the button bottom. Massive layoffs throughout country reported, supply chains disrupted, protests ranging in federal district, San Luis Potos. He continued. Concussion of terror and morbid curiosity driving him to the bottom. GDP expected to heavily contract. Oh. Monthly stimulation goes down. Oh. Monthly poverty change. Oh. Oh. Sets political power to 200. So, wait. So, no matter what, even if I spend it now, it's still going to go down, isn't it? Or, let's save it real quick. Ah, oh, crap. That's not good. We were doing so well. Japan screwed us. That's why you don't... You should rely on the U.S. And then the U.S. is going to falter. Huh. Um, resource extraction. A little more debt. 
Subsidized mechanization. Why well, the farming productivity? Oh, this is good to do, at least. That's going to help mitigate it. Maybe just a wee bit. Uh-huh. I still want extremely good farms. More productivity. Uh, slightly unproductive. Yeah, I mean, 30%. They're down to what? 28%. Agricultural productivity goal. Up here, what's the productivity goal? 85%. So they kind of balance each other out. Extremely productive. Uh huh. Can you get to, to 100%? More stimulation. There you go. Boop. And we're back up to 200. I should have saved that last part, but whatever. It's fine. Oh, you know what? Maybe I'll go back into that. Nah, that's alright. That's not good. Loyalty is still good. Loyalty is still good. Loyalty is still good. We're doing pretty well overall, I'd say, so far. Uh, Kabuki effect? Oh, an economic slowdown in Asian markets referred to the Zuyasuya crisis has resulted in short-term difficulties at some Mexican firms with financial trade ties to Japan. Modest layoffs have been reported by several manufacturers. A government task force has been convened by Secretary of the Interior, Licenciado Gustavo Idaz, or Diaz Ordaz, to restore economic stability. In a statement, Secretary Ordaz asked that the citizens remain calm and avoid spreading sensationalist rumors. You know that any disruptions will be temporary, and that the public has work, was hard at work ensuring public well-being. Long laundry list. Look down the line, there's nothing so gratifying uh, uh, as uh, looking back at our accomplishments. God dang it! We can't do this one, which we read earlier. Um, of course, we're rolling up our sleeves, and then a sudden performance. The Yusuda crisis in Japan has crossed the Pacific Ocean and hit our shores, labeled the Kabuki effect by not many. The economic downturn is already noticeable, though nowhere near as bad as the Japanese have it. We've been spared from depression, at least in the short term. There's no an op ample opportunity for the Mexican economy to change and adapt with a new slate to build upon. The prospective successors, President Lopez Mateo, seek to prove themselves and apply the vision to the country. Already Ordaz, Madrazo, and Salinas have eyed up this opportunity. They'll be tested, and whoever succeeds may determine the next holder of the presidency and ultimately the fate of the nation. First casualty of the Kabuki. Uh, Kabuki. In the room, a red-faced Secretary Ordaz stands up, pointing at Secretary Salinas. This could have been averted if we haven't leaned so much into the Japanese court. Nonsense. While Yusuda may have been gun the prices, it was the government of corruption that let it fester here. This should have been a small hiccup, a bump in the grass, but instead it... Silence, Secretary. Lopez Mateos cuts through the two's bickering, reverberating out the door into the hallway. Another's arguing time is running thin, and while he may have my patience, he taps on the window facing the square, they do not. Reports of protests being roaming rampant are already reaching my office, and the finger pointing won't kill this kabuki effect. Letting out a monumental sigh. The president got right to business. Instead of this nonsense, you will both leave and come back to me in two hours with solutions. Which is the secretary sat frozen, nodding in approval. What are you waiting for? Lopez Mateos hits his watch. Clock's a ticking. Of course, Your Excellency, the two promptly left the office with or Mateos closing the door behind him. Pardon away, Salinas and Ordaz both glanced at each other upon hearing a loud crashing noise. A sound that could only be made by a large object crashing into a wall. The chair, maybe? They didn't have they did not have, in fact, have his patience. Less more less growth, less stability. More civilian spending factor, worse poverty, worse monthly stimulation. Oh crap. We spent a lot of money. Um, due to Japanese impulse to 20%, additional economic damages will be initiated. Oh, even less growth. Frick frack. Oh god, now we do this. Focus on cutting your losses and helping those in need. Bureaucrat loyalty will slightly increase. Cutting your losses and helping those in need. A technocratic counter. Focus on maintaining economic confidence and growth. I like lowering interest rates. Rent, extending rent payments. Cutting the rope loose. Plugging the gaps. Filling out the bottom. Emergency package relief. Inflation will increase. Oh god, I don't like that. The Tabasco solution. DFS support for Madras will slightly increase. Monthly stimulation goes up by 1%. Intertwined interests. Monthly stimulation goes up by 0.25%. For Ordaz will increase. Hmm. Or, over here, bailout effort. New industrialist decisions. Increases G GDP by 2%. Drop fiscal burden. Business taxes will go down. Ahead with no body. More growth. 
A weapon with no handle. Better monthly poverty change, which is nice too. Fasten your seatbelts. Fix this measure are harder to protect. And factions aside from the industrials will have problems with this. Is this a strict measure? All or nothing. Ooh. I don't know, we're going pretty hard into America, rallying the party. Or does and Madrazo have developed a mutual understanding between them? Despite representing largely different wings of the party, the establishment and the Cardinista wing, respectively, the two men have come to see Salinas as their biggest threat. Salinas seeks to turn the ideals of the Mexican Revolution. His technocratic vision does not represent the people, and the mass privatization that would result would surrender control of the country to Japanese business interests and Salinas' cronies. The two men must put aside their differences for now. If they stop Salinas' race for the presidency, They'll start now by addressing the current crises and guarding public support and party for the, before Salinas came. So, I guess next time, if we want, went down and focusing on Salinas, we'd go with a technocratic counter. So, yeah. So I guess we won't go this route. We'll go this route for now. Rallying the party. The dissenters swell. What the heck do these guys think they're doing? Mateos, uh, Lopez, Lopez Mateos. To us, these people are down on the desk with such fear that Salinas nearly jumped out of his seat. The president then leaned against the arm of his chair, half, face half covered, by a hand clutching his temples, in the desperate hope that his pounding skull might seize its hammering for one second and give him a moment to think. Your Excellency, Ordaz said carefully, I'll make some calls. I'm sure once a reminder of their duties to the party and the nation, things will settle. Settle, Lopez Mateos cuts in. Madrazo and his cronies have already turned this disaster into an inferno. Can't take away words, look. Reached over to take out the newspaper, spinning it around and slapping his hand against the bold letters of a headline. Madrazo supports neutrality, declares government has sold itself. Right there in bold print. He blames me for the Japanese screwing up the economy. How is it my fault? How is this any of my fault? As your dad's reached over to take hold of the newspaper himself and began reading, Salinas leaned forward. Your Excellency, I know the situation seems dire. Salinas' his voice shook slightly as he spoke. We'll get through this. Economic swings come and go, and the people will quiet down once normality returns. And it'll return eventually, just once things settle down. This was Lopez Mateos began to allow himself to feel that there may be a glimmer of hope in Salinas' words. Or dad spoke up. Your Excellency, you'll just want to see this. <clears throat> On the second page was a large picture of Lazaro Cardenas. Just below is a headline which read, General Cardenas joins Madrazo, supports neutrality. Make those calls and make them stop. An exercise in authority and respect. Here's in search to Trujillo, knowing the man on a personal level after marrying El Chivo's niece, had taught General Jose Rene Pupo Roman Fernandez, Secretary of the Republic's Armed Forces, that the aging town was a man of rigid schedule and habit. And also tell him that if you break into this routine, there should be cause for fear, especially if you were working to bring him down like Roman was. Holy crap, poverty rate change. We were doing so well. Which is why the old man, during his traditional walk across the Melison of Ciudad Trujillo, suddenly stopped and asked his beloved nephew-in-law to make, take a drive with him. People could feel his blood turning to ice. He wanted to scream, run, hide, and fight, but even now, at Hefe's presence, his authority was too much. The general entered the luxurious car and silently drove the goat to what he was sure to be his grave. Oh god, look at the deficit. The yeah, economy's still growing, though. Oh god, debt to GDP ratio. Ah. Uh, instead, the road. Uh, took them near San Isidro Air Force Base, one of the homes of the Generalissimo's proud and beloved Air Force, before stopping close to a small lake of sewage near the base, a smell nauseating him from inside the car. After stepping out of the car with him, Trujillo guided him closer and closer to the waste filled water before telling him to step inside of it, near the pipe spewing it out. People did so silently. After stepping inside and feeling all the felt wash and splash on his once pristine uniform, people's face twisted in a mix of nausea and humiliation. The tyrant seemed to be doing all he could, not laugh, sneering at his pupil, uh, Lecturing his general on the importance of appearance, down trusting him for the filth seeping into his uniform, and for letting him get so close to his beloved airfield, his eyes betraying the excitement he felt from the power he held over pupil. And not just him, but an arrangement of officers who were forced to watch the affair with barely disgusted discomfort, unwilling to look away. People knew it was not dying that day, but nothing to quell the rage and hatred in his heart, he held on, held on to a single thought. Soon. A short walk in a quiet building. Resource extraction would be nice, but still. Yeah. Population briefing. Oh, here it is. You just have to hold this over. Unemployment at 50.5%. Oh, God. Uh, total unemployment, 3.1. Hmm. Oh, this is what we've been able to accomplish. Unemployment rate has gone up, which is not good. One might not think that an economic upset in East Asia would cause turmoil in the government of Mexico and Ocean away, but here Manuel Tel Barraud was, looking warily down every hall and way, 
uh, in order to gauge whether or not he was walking in some sort of political trap. As foreign minister, Baral had a job to do during the turmoil elicited by the Yasuda crisis, deciding on a hallway that didn't look as though anyone was waiting to ambush him inside it. The last thing he needed was to be assailed by some rube trying to win political points. The Palacio Nacional itself was filled with signs of people scrambling to manage the situation as one might expect, but there are only brief glimpses of the real chaos. The faint cacophony of telephones ringing was audible just about everywhere in the building, and was almost knocked over multiple times by the many secretaries racing to relay some news to whomever. As he moved from place to place and spoke from person to person, he got the occasional glimpse of the stormy new fine wells brewing within the PRI, a pair of men shifting, uh, shiftily swapping messages. One of Mio Shiro's recognized from Ortiz Menya's office. A secretary, finding an envelope on their desk, turning pale and reading in his son's silence, given some task Baral would rather not know about. They were all moving now. Baral knew the Japanese had fired the starting pistol without even realizing it, and the factions within the PRI were to swarm to secure the position. So it would be a bloody affair, but I would say the next sex in you. Of course, everyone would be on, in on it. Talking to an aide about correspondence with Tokyo, Baral was spied a person approaching from up the corridor that he knew for a fact was close to Madrazo. Politely bringing up the conversation to a close to a close with an order, he slipped through a nearby door and passed a pair of offices, moving swiftly onto his next task. As for Mr. Barrow had a job to do, and it did involve trickery. At least this time. To whom I may concern, esteemed Under Secretary Oroas del Bilbo. Hope you're doing well. In this brief period of economic turbulence, the health and well being of our civil servants, especially those occupying such a lofty perch as inside the National Palace, is of great importance. Times such as these have often led to panic and ill decision, causing undue damage to the body, which for those of our profession ripples outwards to the body politic. This potentiality leads us to present our current concerns, of which we are writing thereof. It is our understanding that your esteemed person is currently in possession of an unfinalized report concerning the effects of the Japanese economic downturn on the mineral sectors, pending revision and submission to the office of the President. While perhaps correct in some purely material figures, the conclusions it reaches are short-sighted toward the long-term benefits of cooperation and integration within the Asian market. To this paper unaltered and the hands of the President will be to assign one's name on a short-sighted implication which may damn Mexican economic growth for the foreseeable future. We would like to avoid implicating your good name in such a decision. Similarly, we would also like to avoid any unfortunate implications arising from a set of photographs taken on the 10th of February, 1963, which we have intercepted from attempted blackmailer. Go find cops along the letter. Knowing your good character, we understand that you would never engage in extramarital relations or ingest restricted narcotic substances on the date specified, nor would you do such a thing on September 5th of last year, March the 23rd of this year, or the previous Tuesday to the time of this writing. The press sadly may not be as understanding. With this in mind, we encourage you to deal with this report in a manner according to the values of the party, economic prosperity in Mexico. And of course, your upsetting moral character. Sincerely a friend. Pay to protest. Javier, get over here. We're wondering when you were going to finally show up, Andreas. One of Javier's former co-workers waved him over to one of the corners of the bar. I haven't seen you since the factory shutdown. How you been? Andreas' cheeks were red as a fluorescent light that hung outside the entrance of the bar, and he swayed between two more of Javier's co-workers who were equally as drunk. I've been trying to find to keep myself busy, Javier said, as seriously as he could. What he really meant was that he had done very little beyond begging for work, or that it was none. I heard from a, a Roberto that a few of you were getting together, and I thought I'd join. Think one of you could pass me the whiskey? Andreas was more than happy to oblige, pouring Javier's own glass before sliding the cloudy brown liquid across the table. Javier took no time to down it at all. Letting it burn a sword on the way down. Had a few more shots, in a cut with some light conversation reminiscing about the work at the Mitsubishi factory. Javier said I was finally swimming as all the thoughts of his woes were washed away. Hey Javier, I heard from a friend of a friend that if you're looking for some quick cash, someone's paying big money to anyone to join some sort of protest in Mexico City that's starting soon. As long as you're waving some sign of shouting anti-PRI slogans, you get the cash. What do you think? As suspicious as that sounded, Javier needed the money and needed it soon. His landlord had only given him a few more weeks to make up the money for rent, and barely had enough saved as it was for food. This might just be what he needed to keep himself on his feet till he found stable work. Oh, heck, I'm in. You can do what you must. Sir, please, sir. Your Excellency, I'm afraid it's urgent. The effects on the sector could prove disastrous for long-term economic planning, but the necessary changes cannot not properly go ahead without presidential approval. I'm sorry, Secretary, but President Lopez is in an urgent meeting currently and is under strict instructions not to be disturbed. We're more than capable of handling the issue ourselves, however. Given the recent doubts concerning Mexico's relationship with the Japanese, we felt it would be best for the President to look it over personally. It's not, it is only correct to feel uncertain about this proposal, so we dare not push ahead with your input. I'm afraid the President's schedule is completely filed for, or filled for today, Secretary Ortiz. However, I'm sure I can pencil you in for tomorrow morning. It's a big expenditure. I understand, but these are Guangdong machines that a price will never reach again. They could replace half this bloated administration, and machines can't take bribes. Come with me. I've done the numbers myself. I assure you this will be worthwhile. Your concerns over our infrastructure is laudable, Cincinciado Sierra. 
but your the president is currently indisposed. He has the utmost belief in your talents and those of the relevant governors. Oh, really? It's nothing. A stupid technicality. You shouldn't really have to be there for it. But you know what the national mood is right now. Gotta be seen dotting the I's and crossing the T's, you know? I understand the needs of the interior are great, Secretary Erdogan, but yours is one secretary among many. The president cannot afford to have his name and time monopolized by yourself or by any other group of individuals. Oh my god, let it go. Come on. Let's go. The enemy of my enemy, and with everything currently going on, the last thing the PRI simply needs is a technocratic rabble rouser like him in the mix. Put simply, Salinas can, simply cannot be allowed to remain, said one of the voices. Selling us out to the Japanese when their whole economy is in flames, something needs to be done about Salinas, said another. Betraying everything the party stands for, you have to do something, because that smug son of a gun can go blurt at another before Alfonso Corona del Rosal will slam down the receiver of his phone. I've been like this for days. The PRI was in knots, and as the president of the PRI, he felt them tightening. The latest order of the day, as Del Rosas Orozo, has been informed through a multitude of in-person visits and phone calls What that was that Salinas had to go. Initially, he didn't plan to do anything. He might not like Salinas that much, but moving against him was only going to piss off President Lopez Mateos and encourage more of this faction of squabbling, of course. He kept coming from the groups against Salinas and complaining more and more, and the pressure was on him now to do something about it. Or there was a problem. There was a solution. The problem was Salinas. Del Orozo figured it was worth looking at those who opposed him. Chief among them, of course, was Madrazo Ordaz. Opposed individuals in the succession battle, maybe, but their camps were more alike than they were like Salinas. And those who could perhaps be united against Salinas, Del Rosal picked up his phone receiver again, preparing a down number, a meeting. He'd organized a meeting between the two in secret, and he worked from there. Give me Carlos and tell me where I could find Gustavo. To down, throw down the technocrat. Del Rosal looked from one man to the other. Do we have an agreement? Grudgingly, his interlocutors agreed and nodded. No wonder it was grudging, even of the two men, Carlos Madrazo and Gustavo. Diaz Ordaz had much to gain from blocking Raul Salinas Lozano out and scuppering his plans to sell Mexico out to the sphere. But that did not lead Ordaz and Madraza to completely or even mostly forget the very large gulf in opinion that sat between them. The fact of the matter was that fellow PRI grandees, though they were, Madrazo and Diaz Ordaz uh, disagreed fundamentally. Ordaz found Madrazo's idealism ridiculous on a good day, a sign of mental illness on a bad day. Madrazo, on the other hand, found Ordaz's ruthlessness to be the best, excessive, and at worst, an outright betrayal of the institutional revolution. But that gulf of opinion was not enough to cause him to fight in the presence of a common enemy. That of Salinas and his technocratic mumbo-jumbo, for the sake of Mexico, and to preserve their own chance of power and influence, Ordaz and Madrazo would work together, so it was resolved. No need to make an enemy of the enemy of your enemy. Ah, here we go. The War Prayer. God of power emerged to make her of love and peace. Born in 1943 in Mexico City, young Andre Santana had to contend with a world built on the backs of exploitation and international ignorance. His father was constantly burned out from his job assembling car doors in the Fort Plant. His mother worked part-time as a maid to, uh, to an expat family from Kumamoto. His older brother hawked wood carvings on the street, but his grandfather? His grandfather was a proud peasant who had refused to take the abuse from the haciendas and joined the division in Del Norte. To hear him tell of his time on the horse of the 30-30 carbine, Andrea's grandfather was one of the last generation of men before modern capitalism had broken their backs. To know you is to live and to serve you is to reign. The white sands of Puerto Pla uh, Plata stretched as far as Andre could see, dividing the Dominican city from the endless blue sky and sea. By his side were men of every type of persuasion. Mexican boys like him, veterans of the Cuban Revolution, Dominican dissidents, revenge-seeking Haitians, and Yankees just willing to fight. It wasn't more than the Venqueros and American cowboys his grandfather stood with. The whole of the Americas was coming together to destroy tyranny, injustice, ignorance. Through the intercession of Michael uh, the Archangel, bear protection against all evil. But Andre's stomach was a knot. He was not in Mexico City. He was in a foreign land, a hostile land, full of fascists and Hitlerites who wanted him dead. If he made a mistake, he would die. He was marching towards the Faro, the iconic lighthouse of the city. Perhaps his training was the only thing that kept him moving and not collapsing from fright. Help him overcome war and violence and establish your law of love and justice. The black SIM vehicles were coming down the road. Andre's commander yelled for them to take over. As Andre sided the lead car with his AR-10, he finished his prayer, hopefully not his last. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The invasions... The Legion's invasion of the Dominican Republic has begun. New decisions have been unlocked. Leftists and nationalists receive a medium opinion boost. Cool. Anything else here? Boop. Let's close that one. Battle for succession. Enjoys stability. Oh, good. One. Oh, below average. Huh. Honest the overtures. The Kabuki effect. Ooh. Interesting. Actually, if you want to read this, please go ahead. Boop. And what do you have here? Keeping it in the family was good. All right, arm's length, our man in Japan, the cold technocrat. I like technocrats, it's gonna be fun, but. Yeah. And then the Kabuki effect, excuses his opinion. Yeah. And who do we have over here? Let's just the nationalists. 
Kabuki effect increases opinion. Interesting. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Um, where are we at? 89, 98, 80, 100, 100, 100, which is nice. Uh, oh, and the Kabuki effect. Jesus Christ, this is so bad. But I think about it there. Tomorrow we'll start with us actually finally getting involved in the Dominican Republic and making sure that we do well. Uh, and hopefully we survive economically because now this is looking really bad for us. God, we were doing so well. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. As we'll continue on having a great time in Mexico. Well, at least for some of us. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day.